Invasion of Yoga into the U.S. in the 1970s by Bob Smith. Introduction. In the last 50 years, there has been a huge invasion of yoga into the United States and throughout the entire world. This would appear to be an obvious victory for yoga. However, let us take a deeper look into the matter. What is this yoga that is spread like wildfire across the Western world? It even appears that in the West, the word yoga has become synonymous with asana practice. But is this a true reflection of what yoga really is? In this chapter, we will explore what has happened within the American yoga scene over the last five decades. Mainly, the focus will be upon how yoga infiltrated the U.S. in the 1970s, as this decade has had a huge impact on how the invasion of yoga did indeed occur. I will begin this discussion by citing three misnomers concerning yoga that have been incorrectly accepted into the Western psyche. The three blatant misnomers being carried forward by yoga practitioners of the West today are 1. Asana practice and yoga are synonymous terms. 2. Asana practice lies at the heart of yoga and by design will lead the practitioner to the goal of yoga. 3. The asana practice that Westerners have embraced is a traditional system of yoga that was ready-made to be transported to the West in the 1960s and 1970s as a tightly organized system that has long been agreed upon by the sages and rishis of India. Let us give correction to the misnomers just pointed out. Asana practice and yoga are not synonymous terms, as asana is just a beginning step into the vast field of yoga. Asana practice does not lie at the heart of yoga and will not necessarily lead one to the goal of yoga. And three, the asana practice that is being carried forward into the West today does not have much backing from the present or the ancient sages and rishis of India. The yoga that is being practiced today in the United States appears to be little more than a well thought out physical exercise program which does have its benefits, but falls well short of the stated goal of yoga, union of the individual being with the divine being. Timeline of yoga in the U.S. Yoga in the late 1800s. Swami Vivekananda was the first person to bring yoga to America. His speech at the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago in 1893 opened the door for yoga to come to America. Yoga in the 1920s Paramahansa Yogananda came to the U.S. in 1920 and spread his brand of Kriya Yoga across America for more than three decades. His book, Autobiography of a Yogi, remains a yoga classic and has become the most popular book on yoga ever written. Immigration Ban on Indians, 1924 through 1965. In 1924, the United States Immigration Service imposed a quota on Indian immigration making it very difficult for any Indian sage to travel to America. From 1924 through 1965, there were very few Indian yoga teachers who made it into the U.S. Yoga in the 1950s Indra Devi In 1948, Indra Devi opened a yoga studio in Hollywood, California, 
and taught yoga throughout the United States in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and beyond. She was the first Westerner to study with the famous Sri Krishnamacharya and the first to bring his lineage to the West. Richard Hiddleman Richard Hiddleman sold millions of copies of his books on yoga beginning in the 1950s and pioneered yoga on television in 1961. Yoga in the 1960s Swami Vishnu Devananda Swami Vishnu Devananda's book, The Complete Illustrated Book of Yoga, written in 1960, became an essential guidebook for Hatha Yoga practitioners in the late 1960s and 70s, including myself. He founded many Shivananda Yoga Centers in Canada and the U.S. Transcendental Meditation Spreads Across America Maharishi Mahesh Yogi brought his version of meditation to America in the late 60s and in the 70s. Transcendental meditation centers have spread throughout the world. Ramdas Ramdas became the Pied Piper for American youth. The former Harvard professor left on a pilgrimage to India in the late 1960s as Richard Alpert. He returned with a guru and a new identity. His 1970 tour of college campuses and his book, Be Here Now, established the spiritual quest as a lifestyle for a new generation of seekers. America Removes Indian Immigration Ban A 1965 revision of U.S. law removed the 1924 quota on Indian immigration, opening our shores to a new wave of Eastern spiritual teachers. Kripalu Yoga In 1966, Amrit Desai founded the Yoga Society of Pennsylvania and later Kripalu Yoga Ashram in Lenox, Massachusetts. Yogi Bhajan Yogi Bhajan brought his version of Kundalini Yoga to America in 1969 and established many centers across the land in the 1970s. B.K.S. Iyengar In 1966, B.K.S. Iyengar's Light on Yoga was published in the United States, a book that has influenced every Western teacher of asana practice. Iyengar Yoga began to spread rapidly across the U.S. in the mid-1970s and continued to grow for decades. Swami Rama Swami Rama amazed researchers at the prestigious Menninger Foundation in 1970 when tests showed he could control his automatic nervous system functions, including the heartbeat, pulse, and skin temperature. Swami Rama founded the Himalayan Institute in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. Swami Satchidananda Swami Satchidananda opened the Woodstock Festival in 1969 and became a popular guru figure for the hippies. He founded a brand of Integral Yoga Institute in rural Virginia with branches later opening worldwide. Yoga in the 1970s Lilius Follin Lilius Follin's yoga was carried on PBS, public broadcasting station, across the United States from early 1970 through 1999. She taught yoga to American housewives via television for these three decades. Patabi Joyce In 1975, Patabi Joyce made his first visit to the United States and set off the wildfire of Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga. It was in the 1980s and 90s 
that his rigorous style of asana practice especially grew. T. K. V. Desikachar In the mid-seventies, T. K. V. Desikachar, son of the great master Sri Krishnamacharya, brought his vinyoga to the West. B.K.S. Iyengar dominates the American yoga scene. From the mid-1970s on, Iyengar yoga became the most popular form of hatha yoga that was practiced in the U.S. Iyengar's book, Light on Yoga, has gone on to become the most popular asana book ever written, and his reign lasted for decades. His style of teaching and legacy will be looked at and assessed in a later part of this chapter. Ramdas, the most popular yoga guru of the 70s. In the U.S., the vast majority of the big-name yoga teachers in the 1970s, Indra Devi, Swami Vishnu Devananda, B.K.S. Iyengar, Richard Hittleman, Amrit Desai, Yogi Bhajan, Swami Sachidananda, Lilius Folan, and Patabi Joyce were all, more or less, Hatha Yoga instructors who emphasized asana practice as the main focus for their followers. Each of these teachers brought forward their own personal version of the system of Hatha Yoga, and what is startling is that there is little evidence to show that these guru figures came to support each other in the endeavor to spread yoga across America. It was each guru out for their own good and out for their own profits. It must be emphasized that the most popular yoga guru throughout the 1970s was Ramdas. He did not teach asana nor pranayama as he had steeped himself in a devotionally based system of yoga as well as a service-based yoga. Throughout his time as the leading guru of Indian spirituality in America in the 1970s, Ramdas brought forward bhakti yoga as well as karma yoga. How I Came to Yoga For reasons cited in the previous chapter, the late 1960s and early 70s were a ripe time for yoga and meditation to invade America. How did I come to yoga? And what was the decade of the 70s like for me? In the late 1960s, the Beatles introduced Maharishi Mahesh Yogi to their fans, and he brought through a particular brand of mantra meditation practice called Transcendental Meditation, TM. Personally, TM practice was not for me. However, I was completely attracted and drawn to certain of the big-name gurus who came through Seattle to give their meditation talks at public venues in the early 70s. These people included Ramdas, Yogi Bhajan, Swami Muktananda, Swami Satchitananda, and Pirvalayat Khan. At this time, there were a handful of ashrams set up around Seattle that represented certain yoga traditions and specific esoteric practices. However, most of the big-name gurus who were in charge of these centers demanded a lot of surrender to follow their lead, and the number of people in ashrams was minimal. Marie Svoboda was the one woman who opened a yoga studio in Seattle who focused on Hatha Yoga practice and she had no affiliation to any dogmatic religious philosophy. Her affiliation was to the dance of the postures and to sound principles of movement. From 1969 through the late 70s, Marie Svoboda was the only yoga teacher to have a yoga studio in Seattle and she continued to teach asana instruction at the same location until 1998. From the late 60s through into the late 90s, 
Marie was the hub of the yoga scene in Seattle and was recognized by one and all to be the undisputed yoga queen of Seattle for three straight decades. She created her own unique style of asana practice and asked her students to do likewise. She taught pranayama and meditation and many kinds of yogic concentration exercises. She taught that body awareness should be brought forward in as many circumstances as possible. She taught how to walk, sit, sleep, breathe, move, practice asana, concentrate, contemplate, and meditate. She taught the ancient system of yoga in the modern context of people's lives in Seattle. Asana practice and the grand picture of yoga. How does asana practice fit into the grand picture of yoga? Let us turn to the greatest yogi philosopher of the past 100 years for the answer to this question. Sri Aurobindo in the Synthesis of Yoga states, The chief schools of yoga arrange themselves in an ascending order which starts from the lowest rung of the ladder, the body, and ascends to the direct contact between the individual soul and the transcendent and universal self. To shed light on what this ascending ladder of yoga is, Sri Aurobindo will describe the main systems of yoga. All the following quotes are taken from the first chapter of the synthesis of yoga. Hatha Yoga About Hatha Yoga, Sri Aurobindo says, It selects the body and the vital functionings as its instruments of perfection and realization. Its concern is with the gross body. The chief processes of Hatha Yoga are asana and pranayama. By its numerous asanas or fixed postures, it first cures the body of that restlessness which is a sign of its inability to contain the vital forces poured into it from the universal life ocean. But the weakness of Hatha Yoga is that its laborious and difficult processes make so great a demand on the time and energy and impose so complete a severance from the ordinary life of men that the utilization of its results for the life of the world becomes either impracticable or extraordinarily restricted. Raja Yoga about Raja Yoga, Sri Aurobindo says, it selects the mental being in its different parts as its lever power. It concentrates on the subtle body. Raja Yoga, operating with the mind, aims at a supernormal perfection and enlargement of the capacities of the mental life and goes beyond it into the domain of the spiritual existence. But the weakness of the system lies in its excessive reliance on abnormal states of trance. Karma Yoga About Karma Yoga, Sri Aurobindo says, The path of works aims at the dedication of every human activity to the Supreme Will. It begins by the renunciation of all egoistic aim for our works, all pursuit of action for an interested aim or for the sake of a worldly result. By this renunciation, it so purifies the mind and the will that we become easily conscious of the great universal energy as the true doer of all our actions. The choice and direction of the act is more and more consciously left to this supreme will and this universal energy. Nana Yoga. About Nana Yoga, Sri Aurobindo says, it proceeds by the method of intellectual reflection to right discrimination. It observes and distinguishes the different elements 
of our apparent phenomenal being and is able to arrive at its right identification with the pure and unique self which is not mutable or perishable, not determinable by any phenomenon or combination of phenomena. Bhakti Yoga About Bhakti Yoga, Sri Aurobindo says, The principle of Bhakti Yoga is to utilize all the normal relations of human life into which emotion enters and apply them no longer to transient worldly relations, but to the joy of the all-loving, the all-beautiful, and the all-blissful. Worship and meditation are used only for the preparation and increase of intensity of the divine relationship. The world is then realized as a play of the Lord, with our human life as its final stage, pursued through the different phases of self-concealment and self-revelation. In looking at the main systems of yoga, as described by Sri Aurobindo, it is easy to see that Hatha Yoga has been the one branch of yoga that has been the primary focus of all the yoga systems being brought forward to the American public during the past five decades. If we apply his notion of the ascending ladder of yoga, it makes sense that the physical sheath would need to be the primary focus initially, and that, in time, the other main systems of yoga would all have to be explored and synthesized. The exploration of Raja Yoga, Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, and Jnana Yoga have been slow to come to America. In the 70s, Hatha Yoga and Asana practice were brought forward by the yoga gurus previously mentioned, and yet there is one name in particular who dwarfed all the others during this decade, B.K.S. Iyengar. My Connection to Iyengar Yoga I studied Marie Svoboda Yoga, this is what she named her yoga, throughout the 1970s and became very close to her during this decade. She functioned somewhere between a mom, a lifestyle coach, and a yoga teacher for me. By 1977, I had opened a yoga studio in Seattle called the Hatha Yoga Center. By 1980, I had written an asana book titled Yoga for a New Age, a Modern Approach to Hatha Yoga. The book was, of course, dedicated to Marie. I began studying with Marie in 1971 at the age of 22. I was quite stiff from all my earlier years of athletic competition, and it was quite a challenge for me to get with Marie's program. In spite of my body challenges, right from the beginning of my studies with her, I knew that yoga was the path for me. In the 40 years she taught yoga in Seattle, a lot of different styles of Hatha Yoga came to the forefront, and Marie was always open to seeing what else was being taught in the name of Yoga Asana instruction. She watched the explosion of the Iyengar approach to yoga that swept through Europe and the U.S. in the mid to late 70s and throughout the 80s. She studied with BKS Iyengar in India for three weeks in 1980 as she wanted to experience the man in person. It turns out she was diametrically opposed to many of the Iyengar principles of asana practice, such as excessive holding of any of the asanas, the brutality which BKS Iyengar adjusted his students, internal rotation of the hip joints in Tadasana, the locking of the kneecaps, the egoic show personality that Mr. Iyengar brought forward when teaching, and so much more. She honored his dedication to practice and honored him as an ambassador in the pivotal position of helping to spread yoga throughout the globe. And yet, after she came back from spending three weeks with him in Pune, India, 
she made one thing very clear to me. She said he should not be teaching yoga. She further clarified this by saying that because of the physical brutality and psychological harshness by which he taught, he should not be allowed to teach any more. If there had been some kind of world ethics board that weighed in against the way Austin instruction was being in conducted by him, he may have been stopped from teaching. Certainly there was no such ethics board such as this, and Iyengar Yoga continued to blossom throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s. It was the San Francisco Bay Area where Iyengar Yoga first popped up in the U.S., and where the Yoga Journal was founded. I personally had taken dozens of yoga workshops with many of the leading Iyengar teachers of this area in the late 1970s. Many of these workshops that I attended were held at Marie's studio, as she invited many of the well-known Iyengar teachers to come to her studio, so she could see what they were all about. And the result was always the same. In each of these yoga workshops, I was mercilessly punished by whomever the Iyengar yoga teacher was, and it always felt like I was getting beat up by some puppet of Mr. B.K.S. Iyengar. After three years of giving it a go, I just said no to Iyengar yoga, and have been better off ever since. Mr. Iyengar had a part to play in the spreading of yoga into the West. However, he had little to do with the kind of yoga I was practicing. My connection to Ramdas. Ramdas, on the other hand, had a huge influence upon my every move, especially from 1970 through 1975. I was introduced to yoga through his book, Be Here Now, published in 1971, a book that was wildly popular amongst the hippies. Ramdas relayed bhakti yoga to the masses of young people who were following him, with his slogan being, Love, Serve, and Remember. A Harvard University psychology professor in the mid-1960s, Richard Alpert, left on a spiritual quest to India and came back as Ramdas. For me, his talks on the Asian philosophies India, yoga, and the devotional practices of India were brilliantly framed by his Western-trained mind, and he often drew thousands of faithful followers. Devotional Hindu chanting was usually the highlight of the gatherings that he led. He was a bhakti yogi. I faithfully read and reread many of his books. These included Be Here Now, the Only Dance There Is, Grist for the Mill, Journey of Awakening, Miracle of Love, and many more. Ramdas also brought forward the concepts of Karma Yoga into the selfless work he did for the worldwide organization Seva. In this approach to yoga, the fruits of each action are offered up to the Divine offered up as consecrated acts of service. Sacrifice, consecration, and self-surrender are the three pillars of Karma Yoga. His slogan tells it all, Love, Serve, and Remember. The remembering is of God. We can see that Ramdas brought forward a very different kind of yoga into the U.S. than the Hatha Yoga that was brought forward by a huge array of yoga teachers. Conclusion By profession, I have been a Hatha Yoga instructor from 1977 to the present moment. By choice, I have followed the path of Hatha Yoga from the age of 22 years old until three years ago at which time I found Sri Aurobindo and the mother. Now, I follow the path of integral yoga. It has been a grand ride. 
So far, the yoga that has been carried forward into the West is a small portion of one branch of yoga. Yoga has come into the West and made its first mark. It is merely a beginning step that was necessary. All the other branches and systems of yoga are destined to be taken up in the West. However, I cannot impress enough the need for an integral yoga to guide the Western practitioner, as only a synthesis of all the main systems can carry us forward into the new age. What would an integral approach to yoga look like? I will bring the 70s yoga discussion to conclusion through a summary of the synthesis of yoga, the modern-day treatise on the subject matter of yoga. It is through Sri Aurobindo's synthesized yoga that we can begin to understand the full spectrum of yoga in the context of the modern world. Sri Aurobindo tells us that Hatha Yoga and Raja Yoga are foundational systems in the preliminary stages of yoga and form the lowest two rungs of the ladder of the systems of yoga. These two systems of yoga do have their place in the full picture of yoga, but they are not the end all, and Sri Aurobindo only mentions them as preliminary practices that lead to the three main branches of yoga. The three main systems or branches of yoga are the yoga of divine works, karma yoga, the yoga of integral knowledge, nana yoga, and the yoga of divine love, bhakti yoga. Along the path of yoga, each student initially is drawn toward hatha yoga, raja yoga, karma yoga, nana yoga, or bhakti yoga. And this initial inclination is to be followed and developed. However, from the first tributary, we can make a link into the other four. Ultimately, we need to find an integral approach that develops all five of these aspects of yoga into a synthesized whole. It is only a complete synthesized yoga that can carry humankind forward into the new age of greater awareness.